Hi Ninja Nerds, in this video we're going to talk about hyperemesis gravidarum. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, comment down below, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Check out ninjanerd.org where you can find all of our notes and illustrations for these lectures. And we really hope you guys get some use out of them and really enjoy these lectures. Let's get started. So with hyperemesis gravidarum, we are talking about not morning sickness because a lot of times people get this really confused with morning sickness and this is its own ball game. So what we're looking at here is hyperemesis gravidarum is when there's a severe persistent nausea and vomiting during our pregnancy. And typically this will lead to things that are very concerning like a change in our daily activities because we are, are not able to take care of ourselves because of that nausea and vomiting. It can lead to severe things like a weight loss, particularly around 5% of weight loss within that pregnancy. Uh, fluid and electrolyte imbalances and then deficiencies in that nutrition because of this severe and persistent vomiting. And what I have here drawn for you guys is just a little rough graph um, to kind of let you understand how HCG works within a pregnancy. So what we're looking at here is this purple line is indicating the levels of HCG and over time it will peak at six weeks and then it will decline around 12 weeks and then it kind of fluctuates throughout the pregnancy a little bit. But what I want you to understand from this is the nausea and vomiting that is morning sickness and the hyperemesis gravidarum do kind of overlap in the same time frame. It's from that four to eight week gestation kind of as this HCG levels start to increase all the way and roughly until 16 weeks. And that's as we start to come down, right? And this changes in the HCG levels is one of the predictions or the beliefs of hyperemesis gravidarum or that morning sickness. And a lot of women, when they are pregnant, they believe that you know this morning sickness is a rite of passage. It's I'm pregnant, so I'm just gonna be sick, I'm gonna be nauseous, and I'm gonna have this vomiting. But at a certain point, it goes from morning sickness to hyperemesis gravidarum, and that's defined by that weight loss or that nutrition um, and electrolyte imbalance. So what are some of the risk factors of this? Why does this occur in some women and others? Now there's a lot of research still going into it. They believe there might be even a gene that is linked to these, but it hasn't been proven yet. So what we do know and what we can say for hyperemesis gravidarum is some of the risk factors can be a multiple gestation. So we're having more than one baby. Uh, we are having possibly a high form mole. So that can be ruled out by ultrasound. We have a history of hyperemesis gravidarum, and they also believe that there might be a correlation with women that typically have migraine headaches. They could also have that. And again, this is all relating back to possibly this belief of this changing in the HCG levels. But what are the signs and symptoms? We, we've already talked about it a little bit, you know, we're, we're saying it over and over again that it's this excessive nausea and vomiting but it's that excessive nausea and vomiting that causes other issues. And one of those big things is the signs of dehydration. So our patient, when we're looking at them, they're gonna have these problems with dehydration. So when you're assessing a patient, what are you looking for? You're looking for that poor skin turgor. You're looking for the dry mucous membranes. You're looking for a decrease in blood pressure because we're having a lower blood volume, right? A decrease in that volume means a decrease in the blood pressure. And then also that increase in heart rate because of that low blood pressure. They're also going to have weight loss. Again, I said around 5% of the weight loss. And then they're also going to have that fatigue. And where this becomes concerning is that dehydration, the changes in the vital signs, and the effects of uh, daily living. So any activities of daily living that start to become decreased because of this persistent and excessive nausea and vomiting will lead us to believe that, hey, there's something else more going on with this patient, we should probably investigate. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna get some labs, we're gonna check out our patient to make sure that they are okay. So let's talk about those now. All right, engineers, so let's talk about what's going on with our patient and what we're gonna do to treat them. So when they come in and they're starting to have this excessive nausea and vomiting, they may say, you know, I have no energy to do anything, I don't feel good. You're looking at them, you're seeing maybe some discoloration, they're having some high heart rate, they're having low blood pressure, you're gonna think, what's going on? Let's get some blood work, let's check out this patient. And when we do check them out, we're gonna have a CBC that may show an increase of hematocrit, which is gonna show us that they are dehydrated. They're gonna have a CMP that's probably deficient in a lot of different types of nutritional values and electrolytes, particularly potassium and sodium. 
And then we're going to be looking at their urine analysis and we're going to possibly see positive ketones or ketone urea with this patient. And we have to start thinking, what's going on with this patient? Because they are vomiting a lot, right? So when a patient vomits a lot, you're going to start thinking, what kind of imbalance are they having? And that's a metabolic alkalosis. But if this patient has been vomiting and not eating, then they might be in that metabolic acidosis. So either way, when you're hearing hyperemesis gravidarum, you should be thinking there's some type of metabolic imbalance going on, right? And with these patients, we need to start treating them for what symptoms they have. And these patients are vomiting, or they're having some nausea, they're having some type of triggers. And what we need to do is avoid those triggers and help them as best as we can. So we're gonna be giving them anti-emetics, right? A medication to stop vomiting. Because if they stop vomiting, we might be able to then correct all those imbalances. So what we're looking at here is a different, a couple different medications that we can give them. And again, it's patient specific, specific and there's also a uh, provider preference. So what we're looking at is what medications work for this patient, what combination of medications work for this patient. So we have metoclopramide, which is also known as Reglan. We have the prochlorperazine, which is Compazine. And then we have the Ondacitron, which is Zofran. So any of these three medications we can give to our patient to help them out. And remember, it's patient specific. So some of them might work and some of them might not. And we gotta maybe work through one or two in order to get this patient more comfortable. We're gonna be giving them IV fluids as well. And when we give them IV fluids, you wanna start thinking this is a pregnant patient, so they're more than likely gonna get lactated ringers, also known as LR. But they also are dehydrated, so they might even get some type of dextrose solution in order to help them out as well. And then we're gonna start thinking about what type of vitamins our patient might be deficient in. So we have thiamine here, which is B1, which we can be giving our patient as well to help them out. And also paradoxine, which is B6, which we can also supplement and give our patient. And then if it is really severe, and this patient may have to get admitted in order to keep this um, balance under control and continuously give them antiemetics, they may also need TPN or enteral feeding, which is when we're gonna give them maybe an NG tube and give them some supplements as well. But the biggest thing here, along with keeping the patient comfortable and getting all the lab work and seeing that what we are doing as interventions is helping our patient, is we also wanna get an ultrasound to make sure baby's doing okay and to make sure that this isn't a molar pregnancy. Because remember, when you have iodidiform mole, you could have that elevated HCG levels, but when we final, finally go in and do an ultrasound, we won't find a heartbeat, and then we'll go on to investigate even further. But what are some complications for this? What is going on with our patient? What is the things that we should be concerned about? Well, we all know that with mom, the hypokalemia is gonna be a concern, because if we have that imbalance, we can have some other issues down the line. And then there's also, Wernick encephalopathy, or Wernicke's encephalopathy, which is that decrease in thiamine. So it's usually triggered when you have a low thiamine or a low B1. And what we're looking at is some signs and symptoms that'll be confusion, ataxia, or nystagmus. So they're gonna be confused, they're gonna have problems walking, and they're also gonna have nystagmus or problems with their vision or ocular. So what we're looking at here is to hopefully just correct that by giving that patient the B1. And then we're also gonna be looking at the fetal complications. So with this, it could be the intrauterine growth restriction because mom's got low volume, so therefore we're gonna have some restriction. We're gonna have low birth weight because mom is going through so much stress throughout this pregnancy that baby may have some problems down the line with the birth weight. And they also could have preterm birth, just again from all that stress during this pregnancy, which would cause the body to go into labor. So now we're gonna go into and just talk about what's going on with our patient's nursing interventions. How are we making sure that we are correcting our patient and making sure that we are getting them better? Because what we need to do as nurses is always reassess for those interventions. So what are we gonna do for our patient? What are those nursing interventions that we need to be looking at and doing for this patient in order to get them better? Because that's the whole goal is to correct that imbalance, get them you know, stable, making sure they're okay, and then they know what's going on. So. First, we just wanna make sure we're monitoring those eyes and nose and those daily weights. Again, we're dealing with a patient that is having some type of volume problem, right? So what we need to do is to make sure that we aren't fluid overloading them. So if we are pushing fluids in, we wanna make sure those fluids are coming out. And we also wanna make sure their daily weights are being updated. Because remember, these patients could be losing up to 5% of their weight. And what we're looking at is making sure that that weight is coming back on in a gradual manner. It's not just fluid and fluid overloaded. What we're also gonna be looking at, again, is monitoring for the dehydration. So we're looking at their skin turgor, we're looking at that mucous membrane, making sure that the turgor is looking better, doing a little pinch on the sternum, doing a little pinch on the fingers, and we're also looking at that mucous membrane. If the patient is able to tolerate 
oral fluids after those antiemetics that we give them, then that's great. That's a good sign that we're able to get things back in through our body just by drinking. We also want to make sure their vital signs are looking good, making sure that that blood pressure is stable, heart rate is stable, baby's heart rate is stable. And we also want to start assessing the diet or advancing the diet as tolerated. So patients that are having issues with eating because of nausea and vomiting, we want to give them those medications. Once we give the anti-emetic that works for them and we're start, finally starting to see some result, what we want to start doing is advance that diet as tolerated. We want to start slow and we want to start with clear liquids, right? So if they can do water and broth, even jello, then that's great. Then we're going to, go to advance on to something a little more hearty like toast or crackers. Small amounts, very frequently, making sure we can keep it down. From the toast and crackers, you can move on to a soft diet like mashed potatoes and then move into their normal diet. Now when we say normal here, we're not talking about you know, go home and order like buffalo wings and some pizza, we're saying get something into you that, that's a meal, you know, anything that is a, not greasy or spicy, but something that you can eat. And the big thing is, is to tell them to take those small frequent meals and to avoid those triggers or smells. And with all this advancing the diet is tolerated and avoiding those triggers, you wanna make sure you're teaching them about the medications. If they're going home on those anti-emetics, they wanna maybe take that medication an hour or half hour before they start eating, so we're able to keep things down. And this is the area of the NCLEX where we like to uh, ask questions, because they always like to go in on those diet questions of what's going on with the patient. And remember, we're gonna be assessing this patient as a whole. So if this is a new, severe, persistent type of nausea and vomiting, that's where you wanna start thinking hyperemesis gravidarum, because that's what's going on with our patient here, because that could be that fluid electrolyte imbalances, and then we're having trouble eating. All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video, I hope you got something out of it. I hope you really liked it. And as always, until next time.